Hello friends, welcome to Anakarmi, this is me Dr. Sathoth Arora and friends. I started a series and we will continue with that series. This is the fastest revision in quality that is possible. See, we have all the aspirant friends who have problems and it becomes very difficult for them to understand what is happening. Because they are all the aspirant friends who have problems and it becomes very difficult for them to revise the subject. The revision of quality is a challenge unto itself. Because this is a very vast syllabus. Polity is a very vast syllabus. And then polity also, in a way, overlaps with governance. In a way, you have to read the entire constitution, the entire current affairs. Everything has got sudden relevance to you, polity. So once you have to study this, right, that itself is a very important challenge. Okay. Then you have to revise it. It becomes practically impossible. If Somebody does not encapsulates it very fast. So what I'm planning to do is a fastest revision in quality. Those who are aspiring, who are serious aspirants, will realize the importance of revision. If you don't revise it, you won't be able to answer this question. No matter how much you think you know, ultimately it boils down to how much have you revised. So in this sequence, this is session number four. We have already done three sessions. Three sessions I have done. चौथा सेशन यहाँ पर है, राइट? और चौथा सेशन इस अ वेरी इम्पोर्टेंट सेशन व्हिच इस रिलेशनशिप को बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर टॉक रहे हैं। बिलीव मी यू, एक ऐसा टॉपिक है जिसको एवरग्रीन टॉपिक बोला जा सकता है इन टर्म्स ऑफ सिविल सर्विस एग्जामिनेशन पॉलिटी। दैट्स टॉपिक इस बेसिक स that ये आपको एक maturity दे देता है इस इस subject की तो interconnection है वो समझ में आने लग जाते हैं तो although मैंने अभी नाम लिया fastest revision quality but इसको fastest का कतई ये मतलब नहीं है कि मैं super superficial पढ़ाऊँगा मैंने मुझे superficial पढ़ाना आता नहीं है right तो मेरा crash course भी काफी in depth होता है comprehensive तो फिर in depth होता ही है तो मैं fastest भी बोलूँगा तो मैं topic खा नहीं पाऊँगा मुझे ये आता नहीं है, it's not a part of my habit. आज तक तो हम बदले नहीं, अब हम क्या बदलेंगे? तो तुम्हारा भी फायदा, मेरा भी फायदा. Let's study this subject properly. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Sudhakar Tarora. On Academy में मुझे मेरा कोड सेट लाइफ के नाम से जाना जाता है. S I D L I V E मेरा रेफरल कोड है. और On Academy पे I have been fortunate enough to have been watched 300 million minutes, watch minutes and more. That is 30 crore plus watch minutes. With more than 266,000 followers and more than 11,000 dedications. So I'm grateful to each and every one of our learner at an academy. आपके प्यार के लिए, आपके इज्जत के लिए, तो हे दिल से शुक्रिया. Thank you very much. So मैं an academy पे पढ़ाता हूँ polity governance and international relation with PS and in optional the course that I take is PSI option. For those of you who are interested, please remember the code set life S I D L I V E और इसके साथ ही बहुत ही important है. कि हम लोग आना एकेडमी पे बड़े ही रीजनेबल प्राइसेस पे आते हैं बट उससे भी ज्यादा जरूरी होते हैं बड़े ही ऑनेस्ट प्राइसिंग पे आते हैं प्रीलिम्स जीएस का कोर्स प्रीलिम्स का क्रैश कोर्स सीसेट कोर्स मेंस कोर्स प्रीट एस सीरीज इंसेट सीरीज जब हम लोग रीजनेबली चार्ज करते हैं तो हम इसमें सब में तो तुमको मिलेगी सेपरेट फीस अलग से पैसा सेपरेट फीस अलग से पैसा सेपरेट फीस तो पॉइंट यहाँ पर ये है कि हम जो भी है सामने है ऑन द टेबल है मेक श्योर दैट यू यूटिलाइज द कोर्ट सेट लाइफ एंड बी अ पार्ट ऑफ आर टीम रिपब्लिक डे ऑफर हमने आपके लिए लेकर आया है रिपब्लिक डे के उपलक्ष्य में फाउंडेशन बैच आई एस आई पी एस ट्वेंटी ये इंग्लिश बैच है 50% ऑफ आपको मिल रहा है प्लस सिक्स मंथ एक्सटेंशन फ्री मिल रहा है पहले ये 26 को खत्म हो रहा था फिर 27 को खत्म हो रहा था अब ये 31 जनवरी तक है अब ये ऐसा ऑफर बहुत कम मिलता है मेक श्योर अगेन यूज द कोर्स सेट लाइफ एंड जॉइन अस इंडिया के बेस्ट एजुकेटर्स मिलेंगे नोट्स मिलेंगे लाइव टेस्ट क्विजेस मिलेगी वन क्लास पर डे टू एंड शोर सेल्फ स्टडी फाउंडेशन बिल्डिंग वाई एनसीआर और ये सब बैच लाइव है फ्रॉम ट्वेंटी नाइन्थ ऑफ जनवरी ऑल्सो यू हैव ऑनलाइन क्लासरूम प्रोग्राम फॉर सी एस सी ट्वेंटी फाइव लाइव क्लासेज बाई इंडिया टॉप एजुकेटर्स एंड दिस वन स्टॉप सोल्यूशन फॉर इंग्लिश है सो यू कैन स्टडी दिस इन इंग्लिश ऑल्सो वाइट इज चॉइस ऑफ ऑप्शन मिलेगा विद सिंगल सिंगल सब्सक्रिप्शन एग्रीकल्चर एंड थ्रो ऑल द वेट इज जी अगर आपको अपने 
ऑप्शनल की भी प्रिपरेशन करानी है तो भी यहां पर आज का टॉपिक बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट रिवीजन के लिए लेकिन सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट कि आप उसको ऐसे पढ़ो जैसे मैं तुम्हें पढ़ाना चाहता हूं अपना दिमाग लगाओगे कुछ उल्टा सीधा पढ़ जाओगे फायदा कुछ होगा नहीं राइट फॉलो इट माई वे तो वेन यू स्टार्टिंग ऑफ द बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ ड्राइंग राइट यू हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड पहले कि इसके आसपास के टॉपिक समझ लो सो so, हम यहाँ पे पढ़ रहे हैं बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर डॉक्ट्राइंग नाउ इस बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर डॉक्ट्राइंग के लिए हर वर्ड पे बड़ा गौर फरमाना जरूरी होगा अदरवाइज यू वर्ड मेक अ मिस्टेक ऑन दिस पार्ट फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल इस वर्ड में जो सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट वर्ड है वो है बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर डॉक्ट्राइंग डॉक्ट्राइंग येस द वर्ड इज डॉक्ट्राइंग वाई एम आई शाउटिंग माई लंग्स आउट एट दिस वर्ड डॉक्ट्राइंग बिकॉज डॉक्ट्राइंग का मतलब होता है इट इज एन आइडिया it is a vichar it is a thought process it is a principle it is not necessarily written anywhere right so doctrine of essentiality hota hai doctrine of eclipse hota hai ye doctrine hota hai it is a judicial ideas innovations jiske basis par koi faisla kiya jata hai iska matlab ye hua कि अगर तुम कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन खोल कर देखोगे प्लीज समझने की कोशिश करो अगर तुम कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन खोल के देखोगे तो तुम्हें बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर का कोई चैप्टर नहीं मिलने वाला कि जी चैप्टर ढूंढ लो चैप्टर एक्स वाई जेड में बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर डॉक्टर लिखा है नो पूरे कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में अलग अलग प्रिंसिपल्स मैं फिर वन लाइन को पकड़ रहा हूँ पूरे कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में अलग अलग प्रिंसिपल्स को मर्ज किया गया कोई यहाँ मिला कोई यहाँ मिला कोई यहाँ मिला कोई यहाँ मिला कहीं डेमोक्रेसी मिली कहीं रिपब्लिक मिला कहीं सेक्युलरिज्म मिला कहीं क्वालिटी बिफोर लॉ मिला कहीं जुडिशियल रिव्यू मिला कहीं सुप्रीमेसी ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन मिला कहीं फेडरल स्ट्रक्चर मिला और ऐसे एक्सेट्रा एक्सेट्रा को मर्ज किया हमने और एक नया सिद्धांत बना दिया और उस सिद्धांत का नाम है बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर डॉक्यूमेंट इन अदर वर्ड्स जो इम्पोर्टेंट लाइन जो तुमको समझ में आ रही है वो ये है कि बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर डॉक्यूमेंट एक जुडिशियल इनोवेशन है इट इज अ जुडिशियल इनोवेशन इट इज अ जुडिशियल इनोवेशन इट इज नॉट एक्चुअली रिटर्न एक्सप्रेसली जो मैं वर्ड्स बोलता जा रहा हूं लिखते जाना इट इज नॉट एक्सप्रेसली रिटर्न एनी वेयर इन द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन ये बहुत ही इंपॉर्टेंट लाइन है ये तुम्हारा एमसीक्यू हो सकता है बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन एक्सप्रेसली कहीं नहीं लिखा हुआ कि जी ये कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के किसी पार्ट में लिखा हुआ है तो इट इज नॉट एक्सप्रेसली रिटर्न ये जुडिशियल इनोवेशन है इन्वेंशन है इनोवेशन है जो कि केशवानंदा भारती वर्सेस स्टेट ऑफ केरला केस में 1973 में द ऑनरेबल सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने दिया था तो दिस इज अ जुडिशियल इनोवेशन तो वी हैव टू स्टडी इट इन दिस लाइट एंड इन दिस लाइट we will understand basic structure doctrine from four different parameters first we will have to understand the genesis of this entire issue where did all of this start from where has this got initiated from so this starts from what is popularly can, can be described as what is called as an inherent conflict in the constitution of india there is an inherent error or there is an inherent conflict at least of interpretation there cannot be a error in the constitution but in the interpretation of the words that is written in article 13 versus what is written in article 368 so first we'll have to wrap our heads around what does article 13 say and what does article 368 says and what is the inherent conflict amongst these two for these we will have to study a plethora of judgments of the honorable supreme court which was dealt by or which was dealing with the inherent conflict between 13 and 368 there are several political and historical facts there are several political and historical facts and historical facts which revolve around the concept of basic structure doctrine we we'll have to look into this and at the same time we'll have to study many concepts many of these things have to be understood in the definition of legal issues and legal doctrines we will have to study all of this and finally we will have to study why or what for was basic structure doctrine in the first place required 
why was it required to have a judicial innovation to place something called as basic structure of in other words what was the relevance of keshavananda bharti case of 1973 to bahut sara kaam hai tumhare liye so make sure that you sit back relax a coffee pilo okay or coffee pite pite padhai kar lo try and understand this entire situation you understand this you are going to go places you want to understand the subject far better than what you think you so we'll understand each of this let me show you on my the drawing board okay so we'll understand this on a sundar drawing board okay in my sundar handwriting so we are going to look at the constitution of india not to see so right cool board is not writing so we are going to study the, on the constitution of india and the constitution of india if you recall so thoda samajhne ki koshish karo okay as i said ki hum log isko detail mein kar lete so when i looking at the constitution of india we are looking at two main articles one article is called as article 13 of the constitution the other article is called as article 368 of the constitution okay so article 13 or 368 mein ek bada major conflict hai article 13 says that if the state keyword if the state right if the state makes any order makes any action makes any legislation koi bhi law banaye koi bhi amendment kiya to wo kuch bhi karo yaar tum agar state ne kuch bhi kiya order pass kiya action pass kiya law banaya lekin wo mere fundamental rights ko violate nahi karna chahiye mere fundamental rights ko lekar nahi jana chahiye mere fundamental rights को जरा भी आधा किलोमीटर दूर से भी टच नहीं करने का बिल्कुल छोड़ दो उसको एज कंपेयर टू दैट आई सपोज टू दिस आर्टिकल 368 सेज आर्टिकल 368 सेज इट इज द पावर ऑफ द पार्लियामेंट इनफैक्ट ओरिजिनली इट वाज सेड इट सेड प्रोसीजर ऑफ द पार्लियामेंट टू अमेंड द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन ऑफ इंडिया इट सेज दैट इन द एक्सरसाइज ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंट पावर्स द पार्लियामेंट कैन बाय एडिशन by repeal by variables i'll repeat this line the exercise of its constituent powers notwithstanding the word is notwithstanding anything else in the given in the constitution of india the parliament in the exercise of its constituent power by the way of addition by the way of repeal or by the way of varying anything can amend any provision of the constitution of india now this is a very dangerous line i hope you realize Article 13 says that our fundamental rights is something out of the ambit of the state by order, by action, by legislation. It cannot violate, it cannot abridge, it cannot contravene any of the fundamental rights, existing fundamental rights. This is the mandate of Article 13. Article 368, which is Part 20 of the Constitution, provides. but not withstanding anything written in the constitution parliament in exercise of its constitution power constituent powers may by addition by repeal or variation amend any provision of this constitution by the procedure herein after provided what is this the issue here is this is an inherent conflict between article 13 so first of all you have to understand this old conflict this is a very strong conflict and if you pay close attention to the words then the message will come be loud and clear let's just understand the message so the message says the state the state shall not make any law which takes away or abridges the rights conferred by this part this part as in part 3 if you recall part 3 of the constitution starts from article 12 of the constitution to article 35 of the constitution so article 13 falls squarely in between of these and that is why we can clearly says that article 13 is protecting the rights conferred by part 3 of the constitution part 3 of the constitution if you recall deals with fundamental rights so let's start all over again the state shall not make any law which takes away or abridges the rights conferred by this part and any of this law which is made in contravention of this shall be void so 
why doesn't it will be zero it will be struck down it will be removed from the constitution this is what is provided in article 13 if this is clear to you then article 368 is going to come to you as a shocking reminder that there is an inherent conflict here as i have repeated the words were clear it says notwithstanding anything in this constitution parliament may in exercise of its constituent power amend by the way of addition variation or repeal any provision of this constitution in accordance with the procedure laid down in this article so when i had spoken earlier it was ad verbatim it was exact words notwithstanding the key word here is notwithstanding despite anything written in this constitution in other words anything written in article 13 despite anything written in article 13 parliament may by addition by addition by variation or by removing take out every provision of this constitution or amend now the question that lies in front of us and that needs to be addressed is that article 13 is it an exception to article 368 or is article 368 the all powerful article which can actually amend every provision of the constitution including article 13 this is a pertinent question that requires an answer and this answer can be brought only by the honorable supreme court why because the honorable supreme court is the final interpreter of the constitution of india now there could be group of people amongst us who are just watching this who subscribe to the point of view that fundamental rights cannot be touched they are fundamental rights right as the name says they are fundamental so they should not be touched there is a point of view to which article 368 sub supporters would subscribe to and say since parliament is the forebearer of democracy and the parliament comes from the ashirwad the mandate the janadesh of people and there is the power of the constitution itself is vested in the people who is to say that it cannot decide that xyz fundamental right does not exist or even if it exists it cannot be varied so there is a host of controversies that are possible. We are not going to venture into any of this. That's not our job. That's the job of the Honorable Supreme Court. We are going to only learn how did this story actually pan out. So let's study this part. So the first part of this chapter starts with conflict. Yes, there is an inherent conflict between Article 313 and Article 368. I hope this much is clear. Article 13 says the state cannot make any law which can violate fundamental rights and when i say law it automatically means order action legislation amendment article 368 in fact article 13 also clarifies at a later stage article 13 has also clarified that it also includes things like ordinance bylaws rules regulation custom usage notification as in force in india so there are multiple things that you have to understand all of this and article 368 on the other hand says that notwithstanding anything even in the constitution the parliament in the exercise of its constituent power may by a way of addition variation or repeal amend any provision of the constitution of india by the procedure here and after provided in this article let's see how does this inherent conflict actually turn out into amongst the most debatable and the most interesting and still the most controversial topic which lies in the judicial history as well as the parliamentary history and as us the students of polity it comes for it forms a very good reading for all of us let's follow this part so let's start the entire discussion now so ab actually is topic start ho raha so koi bhi topic start karne se pehle uska background samajhna zaruri hai so yahan par background is article 13 and article 368 let's study the topic now Topic start over with the independence of India. So India becomes independent when India becomes independent. So these Britishers, these imperial powers, when they leave India, they leave India is with practically a beggar's bowl, right? They come, they had come to us when we were Sonia Kichudia. They leave us pretty much impoverished. 
we are having a very massive socio-economic problem. We have many problems with relationship to our. We are still not. We are still not having a proper army. We are still not having. We are having an unstable structure. N number of problems which must have plagued and which must have been very heavy, which must have been overwhelming for the first government. So Nehru government comes into the picture. Nehru government now faces the problem that we are a very poor country. Now, when we are a very poor country, we need a, we need to have development. We need to have money. We need to have development. We need to have industries. We need to have factories. We need to have dams. Okay. This is a no-brainer. So, for that, we need land. Yes. Good. So, we idea is very simple. Let's let's fetch a bit of land from existing ownership, then make industries, then make factories, and then we can do development. And before we know it, poverty disappears. Easier said than done. It's not going to be that simple. Why? Because though India was poor, okay, and though India had quite a bit of land that could have been utilized. But land was protected by Article 31. So this brings in the third article of the discussion. Article 31 says compulsory acquisition of property. So Article 31 kya hai? Compulsory acquisition of property. Long and short of it is ki compulsory acquisition of property which is written in article 31 which is under the guarantee of article 31 why am i using the word guarantee because article 31 falls between article 12 to article 35 article 12 to article 35 is part 3 of the constitution part 3 of the constitution is fundamental rights so article 31 that is why also exists in the nature of a fundamental right it deals with what is called as compulsory acquisition of property Long story short, let's not get into the detail of it. Long story short, if you are a landowner or if you were a landowner at that point in time, then the government cannot take away this property. And just for the sake of today's argument, remember this much. That the government cannot take away this property until its compensation, etc., is always given. For the time being, remember compulsory acquisition of property or Article 31 actually gives you a guaranteed ownership of land. Without being far more into detail, I think you get the drift of it. That should be more than enough to explain the topic now. So now there are two things. So everything has to be connected. So what are you? You are a newly independent country. You are poor, you don't have resources, you have socio-economic problem, you don't know how to have development. Nehruji wants industries, Nehruji wants development. We want land. Land cannot be taken away. Land cannot be acquired. Bhumi ka adhigrahan is not possible because of Article 31. In place, Article 31 says compulsory acquisition of property. Compulsory acquisition of property practically gives you a fundamental law, fundamental right to hold on to the land. If you don't want to sell, then you cannot sell. Cool. So most of the land, okay, most of the land, repeating this one, most of the land at that time, in, at that point in time, was under the control of what is called as the landlord system, also popularly called as the zamidari system. So the zamidari system is now holding most of the land. Cool. So the zamidars are holding most of the land. So you need land, you have to go to you have to approach the Zamidar. Can you ask Zamidar? Zamidar, please sell your land. Zamidar wouldn't have any of it. Why? Because Zamidar would say, I know you need land. I am not going to sell the land. Right? Until unless you pay a premium of it. And that can be maximum. Whatever I want. So, my price could be 5 times the market price. 10 times the market price. The government would have nothing of it. Government would say, no. We will buy this land at market price. Zamidar wouldn't sell it. Government cannot acquire it because of Article 31. Because the government cannot pass any order, the government cannot pass any legislation, the government cannot pass in, make any action or any amendment to be able to acquire this land until and unless the Zamidar wants to sell it. Because the Zamidar knows that he is under the protection of Article 31. 
it will do you a world of good if you just read article 13 at this point in time because article 13 does not only say that the state cannot make any order the state cannot make any legislation any action which violates fundamental right it also gives you the power that if and that's a very important if if the state decides to do some funny business like this please approach the supreme court of india file a writ petition before the supreme court and the supreme court is going to decide that order that legislation or action as null and void so there are two elements to article 13 it is not that you are going to be a moved spectator while the government goes about its business of passing an order legislation and action which is violating abridging or contravening the fundamental right hang on to the thought that it is not a passive article it is also describing what is popularly called as the power of judicial review so it is not going to be easy for the government to pass this so the government is now in two minds on the one hand Nehruji or the government wants this land because we have to do development we have to make industries on the other hand they cannot do it because most of the land is with Zamidas and the Zamidas wouldn't sell it because it is under article 31 and you cannot pass any order because article 31 is following under fundamental right and article 13 says that if you do any funny business with any of the fundamental rights we'll go to the supreme court supreme court is going to decide it as null and void this is called as a power of judicial review i hope tum koi sara ka sara point connection ek ke saath ek aata ja raha hai and you are absolutely now this becomes a problem okay so this is a problem so now nehru ji or the then government right had to do something about it and of course they are the great genius greatest of the greatest right baba sahib so baba sahib is now constrained that if you have to do away with something of article 31 then you have to you cannot go you cannot violate it but can you just bypass it and go ahead and go in some other direction so for bypassing it they pass an amendment which is called as the first constitutional amendment act 1951 please remember this you will be asked this question so inter alia as in amongst many other things first constitutional amendment act 1951 also tried to tackle this problem of article 31 now what did they do about it now the point to remember article first constitutional amendment act 1951 added three things please write this down the first thing is they inserted article 31 a then they inserted article 31 b and then they inserted a new article or a new schedule which is called as the ninth schedule let's revise this so first constitution constitutional amendment act 1951 inserted article 31 a this was a brand new article 31b which is a brand new article and a new schedule called as the ninth schedule so article 31a used a rather funny term right they said anything which is relationship to agricultural reforms their aim was very clear that it was something to do with agricultural reforms land reforms they said if the parliament if the parliament passes any law So now Article 31A says a very interesting thing. Please listen, understand this. And if you're able to wrap your heads around it, then very important issue goes away. See, we are trying to just bypass the problem here. So what is the bypassing of problem thing? It says that if the parliament makes any law, if the parliament makes any law, which is in effect in effect taking away three of the articles 14 19 and 31 they actually mention it very clearly so don't worry on this the words are says article 31a says notwithstanding anything contained in article 30 no law providing for acquisition by the state of any state or any rights therein shall be void on the grounds that it is inconsistent with or takes away or abridges any other fundamental right. 
and they mentioned that this is not all the fundamental rights. This is 14, 19, and 31. If you take, if you care to read this, you're more than welcome. Be my guest. Right, read Article 31A. You'll understand this more. Although the language is a bit convoluted because it convoluted it was because the aims of it was pretty to bypass Article 31. So Article 31A was done that if the parliament makes any law or passes any order or any action, then even if that takes away 14, 19 and 31, the same shall not be held as null and void as even if Article 13 says so. This is about Article 31. I hope all of you are wise enough to understand that you are bypassing Article 31. Plan, plan is to do land acquisition. Bhoomi ka adhi grahan karne ka program hai. That's the entire situation. So let's look at Article 31B. They also add Article 31B. Article 31B takes a step forward, goes a step forward and says that you make a new schedule, make a new list. And this new list is called as the ninth schedule. And this ninth schedule, it is, you can put any law. The word is any law. So you put any act, any regulation, any regulation, any law in this ninth schedule and you put it and once it is in the ninth schedule, then it cannot be held void only on the grounds that it is taking away any other fundamental rights. This is an amazing thing. This is like immunity kind of stuff. Okay. So you take this vaccination, this vaccination is ninth schedule, you put it, that vaccination to the law of which you are worried that one day it will be challenged. Don't worry. Even once it, this law is vaccinated, then it will not have the effect of being held as null and void by any honorable courts, be it the Supreme Court, be it the High Court, only on the grounds that it is violating or abridging any other fundamental rights. Amazing. You are wise enough to understand that 31A and 31B. So if you look at 9th schedule, if you read 9th schedule, so you read 9th schedule, it is associated with Article 31B. Please remember this was not present in the original constitution that has come later in the day by the first constitutional amendment act 1951. So you just have a, have a deco at what kind of laws are these. So land reforms act, tenancy and agricultural lands act, Maleki tenure abolition act, Talukdari tenure abolition act, Punch Mills, Mevasi, Tenure Abolition Act, Court T Abolition Act, and whatever. And so on and so forth, right? We will look at, look at the scenario of Ninth Schedule at a later stage, but for the time being, you understood everything was dealing with land acquisition. Sara ka sara khel bhoomi adhigaran ke liye ho raha hai. So we are, at, we are at this stage, 31A, 31B, and Ninth Schedule. It will do you a good if you can just quickly recap the entire thing. We started this entire journey with that there is an inherent dispute or an inherent, inherent conflict between 13 and 368. There are people who subscribe to the point of view that 13 is the stronger one who says that the fundamental rights cannot be violated, abridged or contravened under any circumstances whatsoever. 368 also has its fair share of supporters which says parliament since is vested in power by those who are the supreme in this country as in the people of this country. And since democracy is an integral part of our entire system of governance, there should be nobody stopping the parliament. Either ways, nobody had a look at this until unless a dispute, which is a practical dispute, is about to happen. So on the, on the horizon is a dispute which is about to happen. Since the government needs land for development, land is in the hands of Zamidars. Zamidars wouldn't sell that land and Zamidars cannot be forced to this land or the government cannot acquire this land under the cover of article 31 article 31 is a fundamental right if you touch fundamental right article 13 is triggered article 13 is triggered then you go to the supreme court supreme court shall declare that as null and void nobody wants to mess up with the judiciary in this case so what do you do you do the other way the other way is to try to bypass article 31 by a separate law so you make a first constitutional amendment act 1951, insert article 31A, then you insert article 31B, and then you insert 9 schedule. 31A says that if you are making any 
law in the name of agricultural reforms or land reforms and then even if it is touching or bypassing 14 19 or 31 don't worry about it you cannot go to the supreme court 31b or rather even if you go to the supreme court it shall not be held as null and void 31b is associated with this new box called as the ninth schedule it acts like a vaccine if you put any law in this part it is practically immune to any being declared as null and void and can rest your case on this part so 31a 31b and 9 schedule are there you don't have to worry start making laws start doing land acquisition but do you think that you are not going to be happy about it yes and that is why in the shankari prasad singh Kyo, their case so what do you do so now there are many people amongst you who are very happy with the facts this is these are the facts these are undisputed facts but whatever has happened are you okay with it that's the crucial point here but there are group of people who would say no parliament had no powers parliament had no business using article 368 to pass first constitutional amendment act 1941 parliament because by doing article 3 by utilizing article 368 by doing this amendment they have actually violated, abridged, and contravened my fundamental right of Article 31. This is one point of view. And this is the point. The Parliament's position would be, we can do it. Because that's what the Article 368 was. The challenger's position would be, that you cannot do it. Because Article 13 has strictly said, you cannot violate, you cannot abridge, and you cannot contravene our fundamental right. Now, in between two arguments, nobody is the wiser until unless it's finally decided by the Honorable Supreme Court. And that first challenge to the first Constitutional Amendment Act 1951 was the landmark case of what is called as Shankari Prasad Singh Deo versus Union of India 1951. So in the Shankari Prasad Singh Deo versus Union of India case, Honorable Supreme Court was seized with this question, my Lord, can Article 368 be utilized to do what they have done with relationship to fundamental rights? Or does Article 13 play as a limit to the powers of Article 368? Fundamental rights cannot be touched, right? In other words, which is the stronger amongst these articles? I mean, this is a very layman language, but still, which is a more powerful one, Article 13 or Article 368? Can Article 368 be used to do what they have done or can they not? So a constitutional bench is set up, a five bench constitutional bench is set up, right? And now the matter before them is argued and finally the argument finally boils down to whether 13 is stronger or 368 is stronger 368 can do what it can what it has or not finally the the judgment says yes what? yes you can yeah article 368 can be used to amend or to change the fundamental right 13 does not act as a limitation of article 368 now, we don't want to go because yeah, this is a fast revision. We don't want to go into the reason of why. Why comes at a later stage? Let's first understand what happens next. So, this time I will not do this. Why? There were some very interesting observations by the Honorable Supreme Court in the language of Article 13 and 368. But for the time being, our first case is the first case. The first case is the first case. 368 is winning the situation. So who's the winner in this? Okay, I mean this is just to make the fun of it, all right? Just to have interest back. 368 is winning. The first medal goes to 368. This is a first time challenge. So by the first Constitutional Amendment Act 1951 was held as valid. It was all okay. Go green, go and uh, go for it. So this is absolutely done. However. The story does not end because now the parliament is now amending. There are many more amendments which are going to follow these amendments. So second comes, third comes, fourth comes, so and so forth. And then we fast forward quickly <coughs> to 1964. 
1964, we have what is called as the 17th Constitutional Amendment Act 1964. 17th Constitutional Amendment Act 1964 also coincidentally falls into the ambit of this very similar question. Can 13 be amended by 368? Because it is also again touching or on the fringes of property rights. Again, once more, yes. So once more the question has been brought and again it is challenged. So the 17th Constitutional Amendment Act 1964 is also challenged now. Right. So don't mix up with the first one. The first one was the first Constitutional Amendment Act which was challenged in the Shankari Prasad Deo case. Now the, in the 17th Amendment, 17th Amendment is again challenged in the Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Sajjan Singh versus State of Rajasthan in 1964. Again, a constitutional bench is set up and then again the constitutional bench is seized with this question. Again, putting it in layman terms. 13 stronger or 368 stronger. Again, can 13 act as a limitation to the powers of Article 368 or Article 368 is an all-powerful one which can amend whatever it wants to do. It can take away, violate, abridge, contravene fundamental rights also. In the Sajjan Singh case, again the Supreme Court says 368. Yes, 368 can do this. 368 can be utilized to amend Article 30. Again, as I said, this is merely a fast revision. I cannot, I don't have the luxury of time of explaining the nitty gritties of this judgment. Otherwise, that is what we normally do in the plus classes. Having said so, please understand, in this judgment, there was, however, a small part that I would like to highlight. And that part was the, the dissenting judgment of Justice Hidayatullah. You notice the word here. So this is Justice Muhammad Hidayatullah. Justice Muhammad Hidayatullah in his dissenting judgment remarks that though this is allowed, that Article 368 can be utilized to amend XYZ fundamental rights. However, it should not be done as a routine purpose. It is very similar to that you have some part does not mean that you cannot, you should be utilizing it every now and then. It has to be used in only extreme conditions. Now, this is the long and short of it, right? Which is going to the essence part of it. However, that the, that certainly draws the attention of all the lawyers and all judges, all brother judges and the various courts that actually this is not a very comfortable zone for those who believe in the spirit of the constitution. In other words, that yes, you can, you understood that part, but you can do it, but should you do it is an important question mark. So you gradually see things in the armor appearing now, right? So coming from the Sajjan Singh, coming from the Shankari Prasad case, wherein there was a completely different thought process completely different ratio on the basis of which the Honorable Supreme Court decided that judgment. This was different. And then happened what nobody had foreseen. Sajjan Singh case was challenged in the case which was about to change the very political destiny of this country for good. And that case was 1967's Golaknath was the state of Punjab. This was argued before an 11 judge constitutional bench. Now, 11 judge constitutional bench? Till 1967, till the point in time of 1967, this was a record. Since we had never had a bigger constitutional bench before the Golaknath case. In the Golaknath case, again, the question is as 13 is stronger, 368 is stronger. In the light of the two previous judgments of Shankari Prasad and Sajjan Singh case, the court sat down and the court deliberated upon this issue. And who knew this was about to happen? By a 6 to 5 split decision, 6 decisions, 6 judges in majority, 5 dissenting judgments, Supreme Court said what it had never done earlier. 
it overruled the shankari prasad and sarjan singh case and came up with a different and entirely different that when it says that parliament you can do anything you can do utilize article 368 to do anything but you cannot curtail any of the fundamental rights in the constitution voila in other words for the first time ever we might say in the layman terms and the way we are playing we are playing as if we are playing a video game which we are not because this was a very serious affair but 13 supposedly beyond the amending powers of 368 the words that were used have been not only repeated very often in the halls of the courts and the, amongst the law policy makers and the lawyers but it is also a very important part of your questions in upsc civil services examination and the words were fundamental rights are sacrosanct sacrosanct the words are sacrosanct the golagna judgment for the first time said and no less the words said fundamental rights are sacrosanct in other words Article three sixty eight can be used to do whatever it wants to do. It cannot curtail any of the existing fundamental rights. They are sacrosanct. So, although we have a very important statement now, fundamental rights are sacrosanct. there are certain statements or certain answers which which rather than answering questions they actually throw open more number of questions emerging out of it so it's rather than settling the issue it is actually unsettling the issue even more because if you remember Article thirteen and Article three sixty eight. If you are reading a plain read of Article three sixty eight, says the words, and the words are, notwithstanding anything in Article thirty, this is not a part of amendment. Please make no mistake about it. Article three sixty eight is right from day one in the original Constitution of India, the so called original. As in Part twenty of the Constitution, it starts with the word "notwithstanding anything" in Article thirteen of the Constitution. The Parliament may, in exercise of its constituent power, by the way of addition, variation, or repeal, amend any provision of this Constitution. Now, this becomes a very important issue here. Is first, the words are clarified that "notwithstanding" in the words, the founding fathers are very clear of this fact. that they knew and they were they were cognizant of the fact that article 13 says a few things about not making particular laws etc so this is not such an important push this is not such a easy answer to give that article 13 wins for example don't start celebrating you know it's not a bhangra time it's not that simple that wow we have won in the sense that our fundamental rights today are winning not there are there is a host of possible permutation and combination everyone could subscribe to different points of view everybody would have different positions on this part what is the main thrust of this entire discussion is that what can the parliament or what the parliament cannot do as i said it's kind of difficult for me to explain it on a youtube video of how golakna judgment came to the conclusion of what it came to but just in case i mean just to just to touch upon this article that what the constitution what golakna judgment said was that if you if you pay attention to this i'm just giving you a topper material on this part it says a very beautiful thing the observation is, comes from article 368 again so what is golakna judgment says golakna judgment reads article 368 in a very different light and it says notwithstanding anything in this constitution parliament may in exercise its constituent power amend by way of addition variation or repeal any provision of this constitution this is where i want you to focus it is in accordance with the procedure laid down in this article 
the spotlight falls on the word procedure. The Honorable Supreme Court in Golakna judgment says that Article 368 does not give you the power to amend the constitution, it gives you the procedure only. This is something new. This is what this is what happens in the Honorable Supreme Court. So my lords are my lords for a reason. Right. They understand and they, they are there to interpret the constitution in a very different light. Things like what you have missed, I have missed, we read it so many times. They focus on this word procedure. So Golakna judgment takes the decision on the basis of fact that Article 368 is not actually empowering the parliament to amend the constitution or, or to amend the, any part of the constitution, but it is only laying down the procedure of, on the basis of which the parliament can do this part. This was a contentious issue like everything else in polities, but that is how the judgment sails through. Either ways, what happens after that is for us to wait for. So we thought that this is merely a courtroom battles happening. This is only between one case after another case. One group of lawyers arguing in this favor, the other one, the opposite one. But what you do not necessarily have to forget that Article 368 is dealing with Parliament's power. And when I say Parliament's power, we are talking of elected government's power. And when we are talking of elected government's power, we are talking of 1967, when Gorakhnath case comes, we are talking of a very powerful Prime Minister at that time, that was Madam Indira Gandhi. So Madam Indira Gandhi comes into the picture and Madam Indira Gandhi would is not, like anyone else would be, she wouldn't be happy about the Golakna judgment because what she sees this is this is not no longer a legal issue. This is like somebody is limiting the power of the parliament. This is limiting the power of the parliament. That is how she would read into this. So she read Golakna judgment as if you are limiting the power of the parliament because you are limiting the power of article 368 is actually limiting the power of the parliament. Now it was her position that parliament cannot be limited because power of the parliament emanates from the people of this country and we the people of India having solemnly resolved. In other words, people are the ones who are vested with the ultimate power. So if the ultimate power holders have chosen me as a parliamentarian and um, in the parliament I have the majority and I have the majority and I can see the article 368's utilization to do whatever I believe should be done, there is no stopping me as the parliamentarian. You understand the point here. So suddenly from a pure legal perspective, we have come to a political legal perspective now. So now we are mixing it up with politics also. And this is what she does. So 24th Constitutional Amendment Act 1971. 24th Constitutional Amendment Act 1971 is what is passed by the then parliament under the leadership of Madam Indira Gandhi's government to apparently bypass the word is to bypass the Golakna judgment. So this is the story is only become is only beginning to become interesting because one thing is happening. The first thing the government does something, then you have an amendment, then it is challenged, then another government does another amendment, then another challenge, then Golakna judgment comes, the Prime Minister is not happy. Now comes 24th Amendment. You notice that it is almost like a Bollywood pot boiler, tapping one after another and so on and so forth. Now, watch and read this art, 24th Amendment. So these are not my notes. These are not my notes. So you don't have to follow in this. Just pay attention. This is how toppers have to study. So it says, statement of object and reasons. I'm not reading my notes. I'm not reading my book. I am reading the screenshot of the 24th Constitutional Amendment Act 1971 and I am reading it as it is and says the Supreme Court in the well-known Golaknath case. Have I told you this? Yes. 
1967. Have I told you this already? Yes. Reversed by a narrow majority. Have I told you this? Six to five ratio in its oh, its own earlier decision. Have I told you already? Shankari Prasad and Sajjan Singh case. Upholding the power of the Parliament to amend all the parts of the Constitution, including Part Three relating to fundamental rights. Have I already told you this? That both in both. Shankari Prasad, as well as Sajjan Singh case, the Supreme Court had upheld, upheld as in had decided that Article 368 can amend any provision of this constitution. Let's continue with this part. But Golaknath has, by a narrow majority, as the word suggests, has reversed its own earlier decision. The result of the judgment is that Parliament is considered to have no power to take away or curtail any other fundamental right as guaranteed by Part 3 of the Constitution. If you recall, I said, although constrained by time, I cannot give you the exact reason, exact ratio of what the Golagna judgment was. However, I still told you that in Golagna judgment, the Honorable Supreme Court laid emphasis on the word procedure, which is mentioned in the Article 368 of the Constitution, and said that it is the Article 368 is providing the procedure, not the power to the Parliament to amend the Constitution. Now, in the light of this, read this paragraph. It says, it is therefore considered necessary to provide expressly expressly and clearly that the parliament has the power to amend any provision of the constitution so as to include the provisions of part 3 within the constitution now wait just hold on so the bill seeks to amend article 368 suitably for the purpose purpose means to amend any provisions of the constitution including part 3 and watch out makes it clear that article 368 provides for amendment of the constitution provides for as in it is giving the power to the parliament also as well as the procedure therefore both the words you should be very very interested in knowing that this was soon after the Golakna judgment so everything whatever the supreme court had decided in in Golakna case was now being attacked or defended as is required so this was the part of this part and last but not the least so first of all, it also provided that from now onwards, the president cannot utilize Article 111, the apparently called as the veto powers in case of constitutional amendment bill. So we'll just repeat that also. It says the bill further provides that when a constitution amendment bill passed by both the houses of the parliament is presented to the president for his assent, he, oh, the word is he, should give his assent there to look closely. Right. It says he should give his assent there too. In other words, there is no way that the president can stop the parliament from passing a constitutional amendment bill. So what are you doing now? Let's look at the last line and that should be the end of it. And if there ha is this an iota of doubt in your mind that what the parliament can or cannot do that, that actually is put to an end now. So there is nothing else that we can speak. The bill also speaks to amend article 13 of the constitution to make it inapplicable to any amendment of the constitution under article 360 if this is not showing red flags then nothing else would what is this showing so there are hundreds of red flags over here so what is 24th constitutional amendment act 1971 actually saying so just to recap all of these it says article 13 we are making it practically inapplicable to any amendment of Article 368. So, 
that actually shuts door to any kind of argument between who is stronger. All this while we were discussing who's the stronger one, Article 13 is stronger, Article 368 is stronger, what not. By the 24th Amendment, what the government has done, or what the parliament has done, is the parliament has just thrown out Article 13 off the window. It's like Article 13, we don't care about Article 13. Article 13 is inapplicable to Article 368, right? This is part one of the story, right? The second part of the story over here is that it says that since in the Golagna judgment, the court had observed that this Article 368 is merely giving the procedure. Herein, after it is clarified that it is not only procedure, it is also the power to amend the constitution. In Golagna judgment, the Honorable Supreme Court had said that the power to amend the constitution does not emanate from Article 368, it emanates from the union list. We recall seven schedule, list one. Fair enough. The third one, it says very clear that it is amply made clear, it is absolutely clear that Article 368 has the power to amend every part of the constitution, including the fundamental rights. So, and last but not the least, which is also in the same theme, so to say, it says Article 368 of the Constitution Amendment Bill is passed by the parliament, then the president cannot even stop it. This is becoming very interesting. By every sentence, what we are trying to understand is, or what we are gathering out of it is, that practically you are giving, and this is the word of the day, you are giving unlimited power to Article 368. So, the long and short of it is that you are giving unlimited power to Article 368. Now, unlimited power has no place in democracy. Yes, that's the fun of it. Unlimited power does not have a place in democracy. And that is why we challenged the 24th Amendment Act 1971 in the Keshavananda Bharti case. So, in the Keshavananda Bharti case, what was challenged? What was challenged was 24th Constitutional Amendment Act 1971. In fact, there was a that there was a, another amendment close on the heels, and that was 25th Constitutional Amendment Act 1971. We have also challenging the Golakna judgment also came into the fray automatically, and also the all favorite questions of everyone that is article 13 is stronger or article 360. So the Supreme Court had its handful. We had multiple questions to be answered. The first question is, is 24th Constitutional Amendment Act 1971 valid or not? Is 25th Constitutional Amendment Act 1971 valid or not? Is Golakna judgment valid or not? Is article 13 stronger or article 368 stronger? And this is the largest case that India had and actually has ever seen. A 13 judge constitutional bench sat down. 13 judge. So if you recall, Golakna judgment was a 11 judge bench. This was a 13 judge bench sitting together to try and answer the questions to what is going to be the answers to these questions and also ultimately going to derive is are we going to save this democracy or not? Now the final observations or the final judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court in the Keshavananda Bharti case can actually be in very simple terms summarized like this. It says, Article 368 can do anything. Anything. But not violate the essential fabric of the constitution. This is a very interesting observation. We have to be very clear on this part. What does this mean? That is Article 3, now the questions have to be answered sequentially. Is Article 368 stronger than, I mean, again, I'm sorry, you layman language, but still, is Article 368 stronger than Article 13? The answer to this, in a way, is yes. In other words, in other words, can Article 368, by the way of addition, by the way of varying, by the way of repeal, 
can it remove can it remove a fundamental right can it amend a fundamental right the answer to this question is a vehement overwhelming but can article 368 destroy the very fabric of the constitution of india the very basis the very mind see when when the founding fathers of the constitution was writing were writing the constitution or they were actually making the constitution of india every country's constitution is based on certain fundamental underlying principles certain identities that we are over here so just just understand this for example if i say this is a pla this is a human being and i say the human being has to have 46 chromosomes i cannot make it 47 i cannot make it 44 i cannot make it 43 this is an essential feature which identifies, which makes this character, this entity, this living entity to be called as a human being. This is a very important part. There are, there are many overlapping features. There are many overlapping features, but there are certain unique features which make India what India is, which defines what constitution of India is. Things like democracy, things like supremacy of the constitution, things like judicial review, things which are based upon federalism, things which are based upon democracy, republic, and whatnot. These were these were culled out of the different parts of the constitution. There's no exact word wherein you can say that this is the feature, or this is the chapter, or this is the portion of the constitution which will refer to as the essential feature of the constitution. No. But from various portions of the constitution, the Honorable Supreme Court in the Keshavananda Bharti case by a 7 to 6 ratio, by 7 to 6, 7 judges in the favor of something called as a basic structure of the Constitution of India, said Article 368, you, are, you might be able to amend the fundamental right, but we cannot allow you to become unlimited. You are not unlimited. But you are not unlimited because of fundamental rights, by the account of fundamental rights. Your unlimited nature will not be stopped by a function of fundamental rights. Your unlimited nature will be limited by what is called as the basic structure. So we are introducing a new doctrine and that new doctrine will be called as that new judicial innovation will be called as the basic structure doctrine where in after now here and after you will be able to amend the fundamental rights we are not stopping you in that effect the golagna judgment is hereby repealed or rather overturned however does not still give you the power to do whatever and whichever way you like hence we are saving democracy Democracy is based on the fundamental principles of limited amending power of the constitution. Hence, this case was hailed as the case that saved democracy. Now, there are a host of questions that may be asked on this point. One of them would be that does judiciary actually does not does it not give itself practically unlimited powers? Is it not giving itself unlimited powers? Because since there is nothing written anywhere, you have to rely on a judicial decision. The judge on a case-to-case -case basis will define whether or not a particular thing should be decided, a particular order, a particular legislation, a particular action is to be understood as violative of basic structure doctrine or not. So on the one hand, as I said, in polity, there is no end of the discussion. Every answer throws open many more questions. The questions that are thrown in this part is that, yes, we were worried about the unlimited powers of the parliament. But have we not given such a power this time to the judiciary? We just shifted the balls. Okay, First, it was in the right hand and we were worried about the... Parliament abusing unlimited power. Now the parliament is worried about the judiciary having unlimited power because the judicial innovation that basic structure doctrine is 
practically gives unlimited powers to the judiciary to decide whether a particular law etc is violating basic structure of right so there are many arguments on that accord also so as i said not the end of the story there are many more elements which were related to that there is there are couple of incidents after that what happens 42nd constitutional amendment act 1976 is yet to be discussed we have to study with relationship to 40 you know what was article 3684 and article 3685 how did that change the entire scenario then there was the ir coelho case the vaman rao case and there are many more episodes left in this saga youtube does not give me the opportunity to extend the topic to that level of understanding that you may need for this exam but with regards to a quick division of basic structure doctrine i have been able to i hope i have been able to explain it to you in considerable detail i hope you have enjoyed this part please make sure that you revise this make notes and also remember that this is amongst the most important topic that you have to study for your upcoming examination so basic structure doctrine if you have been watching the things which are happening in the uh rajya sabha with our honorable vice president also commenting on the basic structure doctrine you realize this is also a part of the current affairs so you have to study this i hope you have enjoyed this we will meet again with session number 5 and until that time god bless and jai hind hope you have enjoyed this thank you very much the worth of an academy